welcome to Three Night Weekend, where we prepare you for the weekend to come with the help of gaming industry luminaries. I'm Shane Satterfield, and you can find me on the world's most advanced gaming website, Sifted, at sifted.net, or on Twitter, at Dinfire. If you want to support the show, head to patreon.com slash sifted. The show goes live every Friday for our patrons, and the following Monday for everyone else. This week, we're talking with Garnet Lee. From his time working at Ziff Davis during its peak on publications like EGM, the legendary gaming website 1UP.com, as an editor slash developer at Gamefly, or his more recent runs at Amazon and Raw Fury, he has a lot of amazing stories to tell and insight to share. And here we are with Garnet Lee, one of my colleagues throughout the years, and I would say in certain cases, one of my competitors throughout the years as well. <laughs> Gar- Garnet has worked at, uh, let's see, you, you made a run at Ziff Davis. Uh, yep. You worked at Gamefly. You moved over to game development at the end of your tenure at Gamefly and went, worked at Amazon with Lumberyard and those teams. You're now living in Sweden, working at Raw Fury. It's been a crazy career for you. Welcome to Three Night Weekend, Garnet Lee. Hey, thanks for having me, Shane. This is awesome. And it yes, I should awesome. have brought like a Swedish flag. I should have like a Swedish flag here. It'd be like blue and yellow. It has a cross on it. <laughs> now, Garnet, not only were you a competitor, you were really a good friend, to be perfectly honest yeah. with you. You oh. ended up moving to Los Angeles for a time. Uh, you and I are both really into house music, and you became yes, my uh, my club buddy for a while. We go out and hear DJs talk about house music. You're just really starting to get into it and starting to DJ when you left really? L.A., um, it was a sad day when you left Los Angeles, I will admit. I know. Um, going well, going I, away got, dinner was very sad. You guys are the ones I miss the most. Yeah, but uh, it has been a while since we've reconnected because you moved up to Seattle and then you ended up moving overseas. So it's really good to connect with you here on Three Night Weekend. Um, let's start, though, with how you got involved in games in the first place. Were you like me? Were you a kid that like had an Atari and then got an NES? Or were games something that you that appealed to you a little later? Uh, I've got that I've got that age thing, so I won't give away too much. But I will tell you that my first system was a Coleco Telestar combat game. Okay. So have you ever seen you ever seen one of these deals? Yes, I have. It was the deal with the two little sticks on it, right? And all it did was yep. play tank. All it did was play tank, and it was like 30 versions of tank, and it had that little button on the top, and you press the button, and it gave you a different version of tank, like invisible tanks, invisible invisible maze, invisible bullets. Yeah, it makes you feel better, Garnet. My first system was a Pong slash Skeet hybrid machine. Oh, I see that thing too. Yeah. There was also it was like the tele- three sides. It's called like a Telestar something or yeah. other. Yeah. So Same deal, dude. I'm right there Same with deal. you pretty much. So, so right you on. games at a young age then. Oh, yeah, that totally hooked me. That totally hooked me. And then, uh, I mean, there was also, there was like the that, like late 70s, early 80s was also the era of like the first sort of like interactive toys the same way, like the big track, which, which is like this tank thing that you like programmed with a little numbered oh, board on the top. Oh, yeah, I forgot about did, that. Like, yeah, like, so like, I've always sort of been into that stuff. Um, I was out of game. I mean, I, I, my family was never like the wealthiest family on the block, so I didn't get to have like an Atari. But I had friends who Did had. Did you Atari. not have friends that you could had, borrow stuff? And that's get what I'm saying. And, yeah, so yeah. so I had friends who had Atari, but actually, one of my best friends had uh, in television, and so <laughs> we used to play in television baseball all the time. But man, the funny thing about that game system was, did you have an in television? I did. Yeah. Okay. Did you have the same problem where like that? The, the controller, the little fl- the little uh, membrane the buttons. Oh, the buttons. The discs and stick. the membrane buttons. I mean, they wouldn't last but like, I don't know, like a, a half a year or so. So you were constantly tearing those things up. We had those uh, plastic sleeves that would slide in over top of the keypad, and those would wear out very quickly. And then, yes. and then the buttons itself underneath would eventually wear out as well. Yep. And then he got a ColecoVision which was like the bomb, dude. That was like the thing. The ColecoVision in its era was... It was name. arcade perfect. It was what it we was had amazing. all... When we would go to bed at night, we would pray for something like a ColecoVision. I want <laughs> like, the ColecoVision. I want to play Donkey Kong that looked... Because we had the Atari 2600 that would right. try to create recreate these arcade games. Remember Pac-Man for the Atari 2600? <laughs> I remember how excited I was for that. And then I got it for Christmas. And I was like, what the hell is this? ColecoVision was arcade perfect for the time. It, really it was, was the dream that yeah. we had all prayed for at night. And then finally it came. The problem with ColecoVision was after those kind of arcade perfect ports, there wasn't a lot else. 
No, there wasn't. They there wasn't a lot of original library. content for in exclusives for ColecoVision. The baseball was really good too, and it had that crazy baseball controller that was like a hand grip with a stick on the top yep. of it, and then you had the four <laughs> finger buttons for the. It was a great controller for baseball. I mean, I, granted, you couldn't really play anything else with it. The holy grail of that era, actually, and I never knew anyone. I never knew anyone who had one. Was the Neo Geo? Yeah, it was too expensive. <laughs> Oh my God! It was like hundreds of dollars with the 256k cartridges, and the cartridges were like the size of a sandwich. And then there but, was the I mean, Vectrex, which was like yeah. the, you know, it was all wireframe graphics. So you got the Arcade Perfect Asteroids on that, but not much else. Battle Zone, I think, Arcade Perfect. Probably. I mean, that seemed to be the right thing to go on there. So then, so obviously, then there was well, then I went to the, did this crazy thing going to college, uh, but. My now, mom and Garnet, my mom was, your major in college was landscape architecture. Is that correct? correct? I, that is correct. <laughs> I have a degree in landscape architecture. Why, if you were so into games and technology, why was your major landscape architecture? Well, I mean, you know, there were a lot of trees involved. <laughs> were you an outdoors <laughs> guy? Like, is, that wasn't the kind of trees I was talking oh. about. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, so, so, so are you saying you went for the uh, the lowest hanging fruit for your degree? You you wanted to uh, just ha get a degree that wasn't going to challenge you. Is that what you're saying? No, actually, actually, landscape architecture is a super hard degree. Oh, it, it is. is. Yeah, it's it's an architecture degree. So you learned art, you learned design, you learned uh, drawing and drafting and illustration. Uh, My first dorm mate in college was an architecture major, and he he studied. Oh. 10 times more than I did, at oh, least, insane. and failed yeah, my... out. <laughs> oh, no. Yes. Oh, yeah, he yeah, only was... lasted two semesters, and he was gone. Yeah. It's so hard the last two years. I mean, so the first year or so was like normal, was like normal college, party, have a good time, drink all the time. But by the second, uh, by, by by spring semester of sophomore year, I was basically like at the, at the, so, uh, you always have architecture buildings, uh, architecture um curriculum usually is in its own building and mm -hmm. same thing here we had an architecture pavilion or landscape architecture pavilion where you'd go because they have drafting tables and all the space because we drew by hand back yeah. then i had to learn to draw <laughs> uh, and man it was just you spent all you would spend nights there you'd like sleep under the desk and shit it was it's, it's that kind of craziness so ironically it sort of prepared you a little bit for being in the games industry because <laughs> you have to be super yeah. in love with what you're doing very dedicated because you have to spend a lot of time, time doing it yeah, yeah. But then the other thing that's really interesting is that you know there's a lot of um, there's a lot of design that's universal. So understanding the way shapes and forms work together, understanding especially like if you think about the rise of adventure games and shooters, your level design is landscape architecture. Like that's you're a good designing, point. Yeah. you're designing environments. You have people moving inside of them. You have other objects moving around inside of them. You have circulation patterns. You're trying to put people in the space and have them do things. It's it's totally landscape architecture. Um, so it served me really well. In, in so it actually did prepare you for your it totally career. did. <laughs> yeah, it was that's really pretty good, funny. Bizarre way, bizarre way. It really helped a lot with that. Uh, so you graduated. And so graduated, and for graduation, my mom gave me a Sega Genesis. Wow. That's which she knew that I really yet. wanted. I know, but she knew I really wanted the Genesis because at the time I was super into football games. And I mean, obviously at the time, Madden football and Genesis was the deal, right? And you're going to college. Thing. And back then, sports games and college. I mean, when I went to college, that's all we played. Like you go oh, yeah. to someone's house, you'd play Madden. You go to someone else's house, you'd play NHL 94. Yep. Uh, that's that's exactly just what, what college did. was. Yeah. That's exactly how ours was too. So, or some little NBA live up in there yep. too, probably. Yeah. So yeah. So same experience. And so from then on out, I was hooked. Uh, I got out of school and practiced landscape architecture for about ten years. Wow. So, so you were, actually did work in your major for? Oh yeah, quite yeah. A I while. did. Yeah, I did game. I did. I did design, and then I went from design into a job where I was working that was much more like. Uh, uh, it was called image management. So basically, I was running image management for a multi-county uh, convenience store company that ran all of the mobile gas stations around Houston. <laughs> so when you went to a store, whatever you saw from the paint to the signs to the landscape to everything that made it look nice was my, was my teams. Garnet, I worked, <laughs> you won't believe this, I worked at a mobile gas station as my high school job. For no like way. for like three years, yes, and <laughs> and I also remember that there were very strict codes on oh. how we had to do everything, like how Look the curbs, thing. how yep. the curbs had to be painted, the colors With they had the to be. Yep. Painted. Yep. And I was a skater, and all my friends were skaters, and so they'd come to my job and they'd skate the curb like while oh. they were waiting for me to get off work and just annihilate the curb. And my manager would come over and just be like, "What?" 
oh, this mobile is going to cut us off of their charter and blah, blah. If they come and see this and they, they come over and <laughs> start the first person the I've ever met who even actually understands. The, so, yes, I was so the funny. Person who, I'm the person who came around and did all that. Made sure yeah. your signs were in compliance. Made sure your pumps were all, your dispensers, sorry, yeah, were all clean. Yeah, that's so funny, man. It's a small okay. world, I guess. How did we never talk about that? That's really I don't know. funny. We never got drunk enough, I guess. <laughs> no, I think we did that. Just, we just never got to yeah. that part. <laughs> so how did that wow. transition into your first job uh, in the industry? So, of course, at the same time, I'm playing games all the time. And I it got to a point where I just was like, I was young. I was working tons and tons of hours. I was burned up on it. I was like, I just can't stand any of this. Uh, and it seems was, like a really boring job, to be honest. <laughs> and it was seven days a week. I mean, it was oh, seven geez. days a week crazy. Was, I was making a ton of money for like a 28-year-old, 29-year-old, but it was just yeah. totally, totally not worth it. Um, and I was playing Neverwinter Nights, the multiplayer game on America Online, which was, you remember, you remember SSI's Gold Box? Have you ever heard of these gold? SSI no. made these gold box Dungeons and Dragons games. So basically, uh, if you imagine like what Ultima looked like, but each of the rooms was it was a con containerized space. But it was it was like D and D D and D rules and like you know little sprite guy, Eric animated sprite no, not animated but sprite uh, art. Uh, and they needed game game hosts. And so I started doing that, which led to me getting like my AOL for free forever. Uh, <laughs> Your fifty six k dial up connection. I know. And so then I started writing game guides for that. Uh, and that led to them asking me to start writing some game reviews because they were still trying. I mean, this is like when AOL was still a thing and they had like the game. So you started writing game reviews for AOL is what you're saying. Right. But like for free. Right. I mean, oh. well, for free. I got my free AOL out of it. Right? <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I don't know. Garnet. They were really uh, getting one over on you there, Garnet. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, you know, it, it all paid off, the though, in the end. Right. Well, it, yes, it did all pay off. Yeah. Uh, and so anyway, long story short was I almost, so I, I, there was a job at PC Gamer for an entry level editor. And I made through the writing samples. I made it through the first phone interviews, all that. They flew me up to PC Gamer, which was in South San Francisco at the time. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed with them and it, I thought the interview had gone great. Like they took me through their interview at the time was come for a day, spend a day with the editorial team, spend an hour with like each discipline and we'll get to know you. And I'm like, worked out. I got to meet some really cool people. Like Michael Wolf was there at the time. Uh, Denny Atkins was there at the time. Anyway, uh, long story short was that at the end of the interview, I thought everything had gone great. I met with the publisher. I go home and I'm at home for like two weeks. And finally I call him up and I'm like, so what's going on? And he's like, well, this is Matt Firm. Do you, you know who Matt Firm is? He was the uh, publisher at the time. I do not know him. I know his name though. He's like, he's like, well, Garden. He's like, you know, video games are serious business. It's like, and everyone thinks you're just a, you're just a little too enthusiastic for the PC gamer brand. What? And so you have to remember, like, this is the era of computer games being serious business, man. Like, yeah. you play, you play Falcon Four with a flight stick, brother, and it is serious. Like, it's a real simulation. You know, that's hilarious. So, uh, so I mean, like, I'll be honest like, with you. My first job at GameSpot, it was kind of that way. Like, I felt like they right. took it so serious that they kind of took some of the fun out of it. And oh, when I first started working at GameSpot, to your point, a lot of the people who were the heads of editorial were PC gamer guys. They were predominantly <laughs> playing PC games. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he says, he says, but, you know, we really liked you and we think you're cool. So we're, we, I've got a job for you. I'm like, okay, you got a got job for me. That's so the job hear. turned out to be a job at Electronics Boutique, the video game store in the mall. <laughs> so wait, he said to you, like, go work at a game store? No, he actually got me a job with that. <laughs> so here's the deal he got me. So he got <laughs> Oh man. Holy crap. Dude. So he got me a job with them to be a district manager. Oh, so, okay. And but my, but the but the job wasn't to be a the district manager was like the day job, but the job was that I was also put on this team that was called like the Sundays team, and basically what it was was me and a cup like two or three or four other district managers every quarter would go back to the home office, which is Westchester, Pennsylvania. Wow, you know where right, that is? Philadelphia. Yep, that's right. And we'd meet up with the buying team, and we'd sit with the buying team when the publisher reps would come around doing their song and dance routines mm -hmm. and they would leave a bunch of builds. And so we'd divide them up amongst the team and then we'd go away and we'd write one sheets. Wow. And so he, he, what, what Matt's point was, he's like, you need to see the work. You need to see how serious business this business is. He's like, to see that it like, is a business and not just yeah. all fun and games. Yeah. Right. 
so uh, it was interesting because that really taught me a lot about understanding, like like being enthusiastic about games and knowing where they are and, un and understanding how to though also critique a game, not just for its artistic merit, but for its like, what, how good a game is this? And also think about like, what games are there in the market that are like this? And does this game do something new? And is it interesting? All sorts of things that pay off down the line later when I'm looking at like indie, indie game pitches and that sort of right. stuff. Like yeah. really helps you like start to lay your roots down. The best one of all of this is I got to play Half-Life before anybody else did. Wow. One of the games, one of the games I got to like write the one sheet on was Half-Life. Huh. <laughs> and and I have to tell you that at the time it was really people forget this too at the time it was really unsure how like we didn't know how that game was going to do yeah and and finally or we did like did you we, write a, a favorable one sheet oh on yeah the game? yeah yes I did <laughs> uh, and because one of the ways Electronics Boutique got ahead at that era was keep in mind this is predating like any online buying all that kind of stuff is yeah Electronics Boutique it was was relying on us gamers at this in this little Sundays group to give them the inside track to know when a game was really good mm -hmm. and they would just blow the order out of the water and right. they would make sure that they would literally buy almost the entire market and, ah. and so and that was big to That's the smart. buyers yeah, because if the buyers could say that either I can get Half Life there, I know I can get Half Life there. Yeah, that's right. But the thing is, if they could get us, or if they could get GameStop, then they could get Walmart to order a second round. Right. Well, GameStop didn't even exist back then, right? Oh it yeah, was they like did. um Babbage's, uh, Babbage's Electronics Funko Boutique, Land. yeah, Funko Land, yeah, yeah. yeah and, well, they were still out there in software, etc. Software, etc. That's another yeah. one. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> They're all gone now. <laughs> like all of them. So, uh, but anyway, that was so that was what I did for a long time uh, until until I started uh, like real. So I had enough money, and I'd been moved to Phoenix uh, because you, they moved me around a lot as a district manager because I was decent at that also. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started writing. Uh, I started looking for freelance work again. I uh, started working with Brian Williams. Brian Williams, remember him and yeah. uh, Game Spy. Raymond yeah. Padilla was giving me stuff, um, and that was where I got hooked up with the Ziff Davis guys. Working and, at GameSpy, yeah. Okay. But that was, I was so actually back then you used to be on email chains and basically yeah. you had to have and your BBS Gmail boards open. and yeah, IRC and, channels and, and. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. And like you remember that just, IRC channel that we were all on back in the day? All the games <laughs> writers were on. Yes. <laughs> and like so, then someone would drop a someone would drop and say, "Hey, I've got a, I've got an assignment here. I need someone to take it." And yeah. everyone would be like, "I got it, got it, got it, got it!" Right. Yeah. So you had, and you had to be right there and be fast at that moment. Yep right to eat uh so i mean i guess i sort of proved my chops pretty quickly um and sam kennedy was spinning scam and john davison were spinning up one up they had done gamers.com uh and ziff Davis was doing all right and they offered back me when pretty, print still existed yeah and they offered me a pretty sweet deal to be on retainer they're like okay don't work for anybody else we'll give you a monthly uh, and you just, and you would write whatever we send you. And so this was really, this was actually one of the most fun parts of my career because most of it was for one up, but I never, Sam and John would send me like, remember those FedEx boxes that are like this, like this yeah. by this, they would just send me a box full of builds. Yeah. I used to get and, that too. Yeah. And, 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 and the half of them would be like broken and shattered when you'd open the box, like the yeah. this would be all destroyed. Yeah. And I, so I had like, you know, I had like a chipped PS2. That was thing was genius. Yeah, uh, bootstrapper, you did, bootstrapper you didn't on my need PC. The debug, yeah. No, oh, yeah, and so there, and then, and then you know, anything that was cartridge based, they'd send you ROM carts, and those were just playing your machine, so that was fine. Yeah, and uh, and so the assignment was this was all the stuff that the internal editors didn't want from last month. And that's how it worked. <laughs> and they're I mean, like the freelance guy. Go through, yep. this, go through this, see what's decent, and send us back word counts on however much you're writing about. And so, you know, I'd like sift through this shit and pick out like, oh, this is worth 600 words, this is worth 800 words, uh, and write that stuff up. And, uh, you know, eventually they were sort of eager to get me to come up there. Uh, of course, moving up to San Francisco, it's a big jump in money, right? Yeah. Well, a big jump as far as your living expenses as well. Right. But not, but not, <laughs> well, big jump in money for living expenses, but not for income, right? So that right. was a big challenge. Yep. And finally... Uh, through so Ziff was working deals, so CGW was bopping along, but they did a deal to become uh, Games for Windows magazine, and that got Microsoft sponsor money, mm. which got them headroom to hire a dedicated e editor head against that, which is what eventually moved me up there. So I moved up there to be PC editor, uh, and about six months later was when we started firing up game trailers. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> not game, game trailers, trailers competitor <laughs> <laughs> game videos right yes gamevideos.com they, they, you uh, guys i mean let's just be honest you guys launched that to try to swoop in on what game trailers came trailers oh, was doing we were getting we were getting murdered yeah we were getting murdered on traffic and video traffic i mean look it was it was the world was that was the dawning of the change that right? was the first like at, after, after i had moved to game trailers that was the first time well ign had started shifting towards video once we started eating their lunch a little bit but that was the first time one of the competitors was like you know what we're just going to launch a direct competitor to you guys. Yeah. It was good for us because we had been floating along at that point. I remember my boss coming into my office and being like, look at this shit. Uh, and, game videos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Com was pretty good. Yeah, And the crazy I mean, part is like, I loved all you guys and was friends with all you guys. And yeah. owned a lot of you guys well, for we like, all friends. Point, like 10 years. And my boss is like, you have to end these people. And I'm like, but I like <laughs> these people. Like, like seriously, like Mark McDonald, like I love him. Oh, like yeah. I'm like, I can't end Mark McDonald. First of all, it's impossible because he's freaking awesome. He's really good at what he does. But like personally, I cannot do this. Like they're good people. They're just yeah. trying to keep their jobs. Like it was very bizarre and and odd for me. But yeah, that's pretty so anyway. cutthroat. Yeah, that's pretty cutthroat. I'm not surprised. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, look, you know, like in, in the in the San Francisco space, like we would go downstairs to Stuffs, and the GameSpot guys would come down the hill to Stuffs, and everyone would sit around and drink Jameson and have fun. So we were all pretty. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like funny. Like there was stuff that happened where you guys had like stolen some of our videos and like had our watermark on them. And did you guys we really? Had, yeah, and you guys didn't <laughs> notice it, and you guys like were running some of our exclusives like on your site. Like, <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but it is no. Funny. I mean that's how it was back then, though. Like that's oh, it was cutthroat. Like and, it was you guys weren't the only ones. Machinima did, did it to us, and like oh, I had I to forgot have, about Machinima. I'd have uncomfortable calls with like again people that I liked and respected, but they were stealing our shit. It's like that's how cutthroat it was. Like we got, dude, we got so many. We had an exclusive every day on game trailers, mm -hmm. every day, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. and so you guys got sick of it, and you started stealing our videos and just running them, and so did machinima and so i had to have these uncomfortable calls with my friends i'm like what are you guys doing like our watermark is on your website and they just wouldn't have noticed it and they're like oh oh okay and then there was like another time we were at an event i'm not going to name who it was but someone who was working on game videos like made a scene in like a demo like one time in front of like pr people where he said something to me about like us taking like all the videos it was just it was pretty crazy, man, for a little period there. Because everybody was it's like a, it was like a gold rush because Game Trailers launches it and it's all video. And, yeah. and Game Trailers just explodes. And everyone's like, well, shit, like we yeah. need to do what they're doing. And it just became cutthroat for like two or three years there. Like I remember IGN like hated us. Like I would get calls from them. We go to events like we were the first people who ever did the developer walkthrough. So we go to an event, mm. we'd mic up the developer. And instead of them do of doing an interview, we'd be like, just play the game and yeah. talk about it and we'll shoot the screen and mic you up. And dude, they were huge. Like they exploded and IGN hated us for it because our guys would go to events and get this stuff and come back. We'd be the only person with the developer walkthrough. Every IGN would sit down and do their interview and no one cared. And then we put up the developer walkthrough and it would explode. And I get these weird calls from IGN editorial. What are you doing over there? You're breaking all the rules that we've established. I'm like, what did you establish? <laughs> really? okay like it was just a really really weird time pro tip there. for anybody watching if someone ever tells you you're breaking all the rules and you're definitely doing something right exactly we were I obviously mean, game that exploded. means you were definitely yeah. on the right creative path breaking yeah. all the rules breaking all the world rules is code for god damn it you're stealing like why did i not think of that but we weren't even breaking the rules we just refused to adhere to the normative behavior that they felt rules. that they had established they're like we're ign <laughs> This is how we've done stuff. This is how everybody else should do stuff. And I'm like, no, like, I don't care what you've done or who you rules. are. Like, I mean, was, there really aren't even It was a rules. weird time to say the least. So how long I love, you, how long I love you the irony, now? by the way, that John Davison is now like a creative person at IGN. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> him though. Up. No, I've, I no, I don't had... know. This is years later. I just think it's just funny the way the world works in like circles, right? It's like, oh, well, John, goes... I mean, John's worked everywhere at this point. Uh, he has, He's yes. worked at GameSpot. At Game CBS Interactive also. Yeah, that's true. He's worked everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, so how long was I there? So, so that was going to say, so I was only there for about six months before we spun up game trailers. I mean, God damn it, I did it <laughs> game again. Game videos. Before we drove up game videos. <laughs> it and just goes to did, show you, though, <laughs> what I was saying. It does. And when we did that, uh, Che, Che Chu moved over to. Yeah, love to Che run. as well. He's Che's awesome. He's like this, one of the greatest guys ever. 
Um, he moved over with Mark to work on game videos, mm -hmm. which means that we needed a, a new managing editor. And I won the interview and the rest was history. So I became managing editor. I mean, you know, like that's a huge jump up. I mean, managing oh, yeah. editor. That's at a when you finally is... start making money where you can actually like do more than just survive in California. Yeah. And it's a tremendous <laughs> amount of work. That's like life it's a changing. Tremendous is. amount of work. Uh huh. Uh, and, and so. Yeah, you earn the money. It's not just handed to you. Yeah, yeah, that was a pretty crush. That's not, when it goes from like, hey, this word. is kind of a fun job to, hey, this is a job. <laughs> it's, yes. Yeah, and especially, I mean, yeah. so one thing about one thing about One Up was like, and, and Ziff Davis, our editorial teams were still small enough that like I was managing editor plus I was still accountable for a good bit of writing. Yeah, that's how I, it works. I had, you don't, I had, you don't pass off your prior duties. I had I had One Up accountabilities. I always had EGM. Always had st it was at least going to be a review queue and probably had a preview to write for EGM. Yeah. And then if CGW needed filled, that was there that too. We had lost official PlayStation Magazine by that time. Yeah. So I didn't have to worry about that. Uh, so uh, then of course we got bought out. We then then we lost. You know, prints going down at the same time. And Ziff had a ton of print uh, debt. There's you. Can, you can find out about what happened to Ziff on it's, uh, plenty of places. You don't need that story from me, but although Ziff has, has survived, which is I'm impressed with. Well, their management, I believe, has done a pretty. It's good a different Ziff. <laughs> it is, it's but it's still there. <laughs> the name's there. Companies are not there anymore. It's true. Hearst bought us through UGO, which was a bizarre purchase. Yeah. Uh, her, that, that's a New York company. Uh, they were comfortable with UGO because they had UGO was another Madison Avenue sort of uh, marketing roll up for the video game business yeah it wasn't uh, really an editorial thing no it wasn't yeah yeah it's, it, it was actually a collection of sites that they had put marketing spends against mm -hmm. uh and so they were looking for us for they just needed more inventory they were just trying to sell more inventory right yep. uh so they got rid of 80 percent of the staff and i was part of the 20 percent that, that stayed yeah which was certainly which was heartbroken and you're like you're like i need my job so i have to stay but it was it was it was bad Meanwhile, you're that. going out to drink with your buddies who lost their jobs and you're oh, yeah. staying it's awkward it's tough like when it's i worked so at GameSpot, and they were bought by cnet and ziff davis sold GameSpot to cnet right. cnet already had a games website called game center and for the first six weeks they <laughs> shoved us together in a room GameSpot and game oh, center Lord. in the same room knowing that one of us was going to get cut. And within like a That's week dire. and a half, it became obvious that Game Center was going to be the one that got cut. And then they kept us in that room together for another four weeks. And it was oh, wow. the most awkward work environment I've ever been in my life. You'd be sitting there and one of the Game Center guys would just yell out at the top of their lungs, fuck this shit. Like, and you're just sitting there and you're like, uh, like a wow. dead quiet room. Where everyone's pecking away at their keyboards. Fuck this shit. And you're just like, oh shit uh is someone gonna bring a gun in here like it was bad dude and like the management there couldn't wow. figure it out and weren't like you know what we should probably like separate these teams or we need to move more quickly on what we're doing with game center and it just languished on for like weeks and weeks the crazy part is i just talked to greg kasavin uh for oh god Center. wow there's a name i haven't heard yeah that's awesome well you know he's a super giant now yeah, and he, making he's, amazing he's, he's, a narr he's narrative director and they yeah. just landed hades and it's such a freaking killer game 50 game of the year awards yeah so i just that's talked to him and we actually did not talk about this the awkward game spot game center transition where literally i was worried that someone was going to come in and like shoot up the workplace for like four weeks because really? they had been there for tense. a long time and you got to realize these jobs especially back then they were so like precious like to stay in the industry or have a job in the industry doing what we did, like you knew that it was a big deal, that you were very lucky. Oh. And that's why we worked so hard because you knew everybody was pining for these jobs. It's like, if you didn't like work your ass off, someone was going to take your job. Like that's pretty much how it was. And there were so many people that were up, no up and coming and like, it was cutthroat, like literally cutthroat. And the game center guys had, you know, they had been working hard on game center for years. And like, it was just going to be dissolved and they weren't having it, man. Like, People were like stealing like equipment out of their PCs, like their video. It was crazy. So anyway, on with your your story. It, it, that's a, you raise a really good point. I mean, I think any of us, but especially folks like myself who had a really good ride, especially through the two thousands. Like yeah, we know we worked hard, and we will always, you know, we, we I will talk about like it was hard work. We worked late, we worked all the time, and you know, I had like there's a reason I had a bar in my office, but yeah, uh, but. I, I make no mistake about it. I totally appreciate also that I had a lot of good fortune. I yeah, mean, it takes some luck. Every single the right person place at who, the right time. Somebody yeah. hooking you up, um, hooking or, you up yeah, with or, a job. Or right, if you right use place, a job. right play, right? 
you know, like the fact that I had been managing editor, the fact that I had enough experience and background and in, in uh, management to like move over to be executive editor. Cause then I went, then I went over and was executive editor. Uh, and then like, to, did what happened? Well, well, you... Why did one up fail? Cause look, there's still a lot of people that still to this day, like, you know, the one up show, I'll say this, like, I didn't really <sighs> like the show that much, but it was groundbreaking. It was like a reality TV show so... slash like podcast slash like nobody had done anything like game videos. So what? UGO got uh, in one of the odd moves, UGO, when they bought, when Hearst bought us through UGO, they gutted game videos. And one of the first moves was to get rid of all original production equipment, uh, all original production, right? Because mm -hmm. it's time consuming, it's expensive. They slimmed it down to uh, just Tina Sanchez and, uh, and a producer. And I don't even remember who the producer was. They got rid of Ryan and Ryan's whole team because Ryan. they were expensive. O'Donnell. Okay. And they and so they they cut that whole team and that was I mean I, to this day they got a, it, it's bizarre that they did that but keep in mind UGO was also not selling they weren't a video marketing arm they were they were a web placement they were looking for web traffic yeah uh, and so from there what they were really looking for us to do and I mean I, I, Sam and I are really good friends but like uh, there was a year there that he and I didn't get along very well because. Uh, uh, they were leaning on him very hard to do specific content, like basically like clickbait content, because they yeah. and they, and the kind of stuff now where you see Listicles like listicles and yeah, right. And it's just like you know we had we had a proud reputation for the editorial content we'd done. Um, so I started looking, uh, and uh, uh, I forget. I, well, so actually, funny story. <laughs> this was this was really interesting. So uh, I myself and Stephen Dottillo. And Nguy Kroll and Jeff Keeley almost launched our own website. Really? Yes. That would have been a good crew. It was, and it was a, and basically the idea was to do game videos, but all original production video. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was going to be an all video site endeavor, but like really, you know, like very much like narrative driven stuff, right? That's an interesting because Keeley at that time was working with us on game trailers and doing game trailers TV on Spike TV. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And this so is right. That before might it. be construed as a conflict of interest for Mr. Keeley at the time. Oh, I think he, so. Yeah, he would have busted out. Yeah, he would have busted out. It was a good deal. So the whole the whole deal was and we actually this is how close we got. We were papered by Sequoia. So this thing was uh, Sequoia is a B is a VR, yeah. uh, VR uh, an investment company up in up in the Bay Area, uh, venture capitalists. And yeah, so we got all the way to the last we got all I mean, I lawyered up. Everyone had everyone was in. We had 18 months of Series A, which mm -hmm. meant that after about 12 months, we were have to go look for Series B. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's that's pretty standard. No yeah. big deal. They, everything was cool. Uh, and one of the four of us uh, at the last minute got cold feet and couldn't wouldn't sign. You're not going to say literally, who? Literally, I, I don't think it's it's not. It's not. <laughs> I, I think if you use your imagination. <laughs> you can figure out which one it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but regardless, not some, it, it was it was a great it was a great opportunity. And, and I like the the relationship built with those three folks and the like the ideas that were shared there was really, really cool. But out of that, I met Sean Spector, who was the founder of Gamefly, and he was wanting to. He, he was looking at Gamefly, which, of course, is the by mail rental uh, video game company and like, hey, like this is cool. Except yeah, the Netflix of video games back when Netflix right. used to send out DVDs by mail. Right. And, and he looked at that and he said, well, you know, here's the problem with Netflix's model is that they don't have a community and they've done nothing like they, they become the de facto source for movie rental. But there's nothing cool about it. Like it's yeah. just all they are is a warehouse that you click on and get stuff out of. And at the time, he was buying IGN syndicated content, uh, and he decided that he wanted to build an editorial component. And be, and they're like, hey, I want to build a community. Uh, yeah. So he hired me to come down there and run that. And uh, we bought Shack News as the backbone for that, which was cool because we and we bought it specifically. Because, Shack News uh, had a great reputation at that point. That's it exactly PC, why we bought it. Was it was PC centric, but PC centric. And but his reputation it, was. Was Peerless. Sterling. Yeah. Right. And I was super happy about that. And then the other thing that it had was it had this thing called Chatty. And if you've ever been on Shack News, you'll know what Chatty is. And otherwise, it won't make sense to you. But imagine it's, it's like it is not. It is a 24 hour rolling message board chat stream. So imagine it's like it's like message board messages that are all threaded, 
but it rolls every 24 hours. Every message posts last 24 hours and it rolls on. So it's like it's like this really cool sort of like stream of consciousness, like conversation building thing. So and the community was really engaged. We're like, this is gonna be a really cool way to build. And then we bought Moby Games to be the data set, database for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, of course, as, uh, as, as had been warned, building websites and putting back ends together is much harder than you think it's going to be. Yeah. I've, I've done it myself. Uh, it's sifted. <laughs> Absolutely. So a lot uh, of work. we, we got bogged down in the, we got really bogged down in how to manage consolidating the Moby games data and the game fly data. Right. Because the, because the, 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 the key thing here was to eventually we wanted to have a game page where when you, they went to rent Tekken three or whatever you went to rent, it would have like some editorial content from us, some syndicated editorial content and then a way to rent it and put it in your queue and all that kind of stuff. Right. So for that to work, the, the data back end has to be uh, put, to, put together and be one data back end. And Moby's, da Moby's data back end was not in a shape to match up to the Gamefly back end very well. I mean, let's be uh, honest, all the websites from that era migrating data from one to another was virtually impossible. I mean, you could see it with IGN, the way IGN's back end was built. It made it very difficult for IGN to update its website yeah. throughout the years. Um, well, this is what, so yes, but nothing what, was standardized what back then. Yeah, that's what happened. One of the things that happened to one up, by the way, and, and I don't know the exact history of why it completely got gone after IGN bought it, but the, the IGN, I mean, by the one up, by the time one up went away, I mean, it was held together by who knows what. The, keep in mind, one up, one of the things Sam's original deal was that you had blogs on it. Yeah. Remember, we had like that whole blogging mm -hmm. system. Yeah. And keeping that thing operational within a editorial publishing framework, and again, linking back to games was a mess. See, this is this happened to game trailers too. Um, game trailers was its own standalone site. It was great, and we yep. kept updating game trailers on its own. It was fine, uh, but at a certain point, Viacom was like, "Okay, you can't be your own website anymore. We want you yep. to migrate game trailers into this huge." Thing that we have that we're running like all these websites off of for like MTV <sighs> and Spike TV and Comedy Central. And those websites were awful, but they wanted it all standardized because sure. they didn't want to have separate salespeople selling stuff just for game trailers. They wanted to sell stuff that would work across the entire network. And I it mean, was, look, it literally, for what you know now, and for what you know now, they actually needed that. Yeah, they needed the inventory consolidation. Yeah. But, but it killed game but, trailers because when we migrated over the day we turned the switch, we lost 30,000 redirects oh. just like that. So all the SEO that we had built on, it's all gone. And literally like our traffic went dropped like 80% in one day and it was too late to go back. It literally killed game trailers. So I mm. totally understand where you're coming from. Wow. That's yep. heavy. It is That's heavy. It. And I had to, I was forced to work on it knowing it was going to happen the whole and you time guys call, probably, for you like 18 probably, months. You called that out for them and they just decided to. Yeah, well, that, about it. yeah, I'm just the, the games guy. You know, I'm not the guy who's working <laughs> in ad ops and all these departments that they were listening to. I'm like the guy on game trailers who's who's holding on to the past and, you know, unwilling to Jane, stop uh, holding on to the past, bro. Right. And unwilling <laughs> to move into this new future. And look, I understood their perspective. I was just telling them, I'm like, you need to put all your websites on our backbone instead of vice versa, because yeah. their websites weren't doing squat, dude. Game trailers traffic was like all their websites combined. Like we were doing more traffic than all their websites combined. And instead of putting their stuff onto our backbone, it went the other way and it killed game trailers, literally killed it. So I totally understand where you're coming from there. Sounds like an airline merger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not all that dissimilar for sure. So so one up goes away you move to yep. fly and you yep, move to la and you're moved to LA, LA, get that so which so is how we ended up, up becoming friends because finally yeah. we're down here yep so that editorial gets spun up and it's all working but basic reality is we figure out that okay we're not gonna be able to combine this stuff but we'll build an editorial system i get the editorial system going it's running pretty well and to be honest i'm like i've done this i'm kind of like starting to get a little restless because you know it's just, just doing the same thing yeah. and at the exact same time was when microsoft was saying it was telling people quietly that they were moving to a locked digital system. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. There are no more, no more discs. Yeah. No more game, no more used games, no more yeah. game rental, mm -hmm. no more game rental. Well, actually, it's, what was it like? I want to spin back a little bit. What was it like working at Gamefly? Were, 
and do running editorial because there's a little bit of a conflict of interest there where they I don't really know it, there, what, there, there was no, yeah. never any undue influence on you where they were like you know what you need to promote this game more than others because we've ordered a ton of these and we need to get these this game rented no, if anything like if that. anything they came to us and were like what games like back it was almost hearkening back to like electronics boutique like the buyer would come to us and be like hey i've got x thousands of this game ordered do you think i'm gonna be okay gotcha okay so they were doing it the right way they were listening yeah. to, to help them to figure out how many to buy essentially yeah oh, just sean, i mean okay. sean's a big time gamer he's an besides being a good entrepreneur he's a big time gamer now the funny thing was sean had stepped aside from running it as often happens in venture capitalists started things the yeah. the, the, the the original the founder entrepreneur gets shoved out yeah he didn't get shoved out he just took like the biz dev side so when it looked like when it looked like the consoles were going to be digitally locked mm -hmm. uh and this is still again, hasn't I, happened. <laughs> remember, I knew them through Sequoia. So Gamefly is a Sequoia-funded business. Uh -huh. Sequoia started getting cold feet and worrying that, oh, my God, what are you guys going to do? Because if your main revenue stream goes away, we're going to have a bunch of money investing in Gamefly and be dead. Uh -huh. So they pumped some cash into Gamefly and gave us the opportunity to try game development. And so we took a two-pronged approach. Do you know Andy Swanson? Mm, uh, I don't, probably no one, he, he's I don't around, know him, but I know, but you know him. him. He's been switching stuff. Yeah. And so he and I were working together. Uh, he, he led the effort. Uh, we bought Direct Drive. Remember the old Direct Drive? Yeah, store? probably we the, not a good idea. <laughs> well, I mean, so we bought that in order to have a digital storefront. Steam at the time was not the juggernaut it is today. I mean, mm -hmm. Steam, Steam was still trying to deal with the whole like people being pissed off that the Steam client doesn't run right and people mm -hmm. being pissed off at the Steam client being like a, like in their computer, which now we love, but you which... know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Times change. <laughs> they sure do. Uh, and then I was given a, I was like, this is like the dream job. I was given a bag of money and told to go make some mobile games. At Gamefly. So, yeah. yeah. And why, yeah, so... why, would, why would they want to do that? Uh, we wanted to do that because it was the dawn. It was like you say we. That, was that your idea to do this? It was Sean Spector's idea, and and he knew me well enough, and he thought he's like it. And also, he's so he's funny. He's a former uh, CAA guy, uh, and he's like he's like you, he's like you can do this. He's like I've seen talent people before. He's like you get it. He's CAA like, is a talent like, agency for those who don't. Oh, know. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 So he's like, he's like, you know, how, he's like, you know, how does, you know, you know, you know how to look at this stuff. You know how to judge a deal. I'll have your back as far as like the deal writing stuff. Go, we, we can, we can give this a go because it was right at the era, like free to play hadn't really taken hold yet. It was the first era of like premium games. Right. And we all thought, wow, man, the iPhone's going to be like the gaming platform of the future. You're right, <laughs> right though. I mean, it is. We were right, but we got so we so we got slaughtered twofold. It takes from the time that I started with a hey, I've got some money to go look for games to having my first three games signed and in production was about twenty months. Yeah, that's too long. Yeah, because but, but that's, that's how long it down, takes. <laughs> that's how long it takes. And during that time, CSR Racing came out. Mm. And and you know and the whole world started to change and uh, oh god what was the Boom Beach predecessor? Garnet, I remember you pushing these games on me. By the way, <laughs> you would be like, "Hey, here's this new mobile game that I'm working on over here at GameFly. Like, check it out." And I was like, "What are you doing, Garnet? <laughs> making mobile games." <laughs> To be fair, I mean, I learned a lot. I learned yeah, yeah, a I'm lot, sure. man. I'm sure I you mean, did. It was, yeah, it was a great way to learn. Um, and we made three good games. I mean, all of our games had good reviews. It just uh, we were trying to make premium games as the world was changing. Mm -hmm. The last game, uh, Song Blaster, we tried to move. I remember over. that one. Yeah, that's the one I actually it. stuck with. I think the most of all the ones you sent over to me. It was a fun game. Yeah. Uh, well, it was a it was a mix of what we like. It was a mix of music and gaming. And so yeah. it, it resonated with me more than the others. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I mean, in hindsight, I was I was stupid to let the management i was stupid to let myself and sean be tricked into thinking that we could take a game that was designed to be a premium game and turn it into a free-to-play game mm -hmm. because free-to-play is an economy like you know all the systems it needs it just wasn't built for that mm -hmm. uh so anyway long story short was and then we got hit blindsided with sony like pulling the carpet out from me at microsoft and saying by the way there's going to be discs yeah and so now Gamefly isn't interested in any of the stuff we're doing anymore. So it sells direct to drive, says those three games are all you're making and boots Andy and I out the door. So why would they That's boot how... you out the door instead of just putting you back on 
editorial because because i had built that because the editorial thing was running like a clock i had built it to where it was running great it didn't need it didn't need a, a paid a person at my level to run it anymore it was doing uh, its thing the editorial team was doing its thing they were they were awesome zav D'Amato's was there like they were doing their thing they're on top of their business shack news good. and while yeah, you were shack there you launched weekend confirmed right that is true we also launched weekend confirmed which i kept going the whole time also that now but, that was kind of your crowning achievement editorially at game i would argue yeah I, people always say it's like, I don't know. So there's one up yours. There's listen up. No, I mean, while you were there, while you oh, were at GameFly. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, I would say for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was like, that's I was on I that show had. a couple times. It was fun. You guys had a nice oh, studio. I, I remember I would go in there and I'd be like, where are they getting the money for this shit? Like, <laughs> okay. So like it was like a legit, story. like recording studio. Atlantis. And like, you'd have to like key card me to get in. And I was like, what is like, wow, where's this money coming from for this stuff? So this is like, you'll appreciate this as an LA guy. Again, Sean, former CAA guy. Uh -huh. CAA guys are talent agents. Talent agents, people know people in the business. Yep. So that studio we were using was Atlantis Group Studios, right? Mm -hmm. And they had like some, they had basically free space that they gave to us on that Thursday evening for like dirt cheap, for dirt cheap. I, I still mean. have a weekend confirmed t-shirt from the last time I was on the show. I think I may have been on, the last episode or like the next oh, really? to last episode? Yeah. Before you anyway, moved on and they, they folded the show. And once we started doing it, once we started doing it, you remember the engineering team, they're like, they liked doing it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, and they and they all ran, they ran and owned the studio themselves. So, they, I mean, they kept the deal. They kept the deal going. It was fun. We always had a good time. And then, you know, we'd always go out for drinks and stuff afterwards and mm -hmm. Uncle Gamefly would pay. So, you know, it was just that was a it was crazy. That's literally a studio where like platinum records and shit had been. Oh, I know. That's what I said. Like <laughs> I've worked I have worked at, at MTV for like eight years. I knew what like good facilities were. And I walked in there, I was like, what the hell <laughs> is going on here, man? Like, we're really gonna record a podcast about video games in here? Like <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. It was so ridiculous. I was like, damn, this is bougie. Like, what's going on here, Garnet? Like, you guys got some mob money or something? Like <laughs> No, no mob money, but yeah, it was, it was pretty boosh. It was pretty boosh, wasn't it? Yep, yep it was. Yeah. So you left Gamefly, yeah. and then you got a job at Amazon. What was your first gig at Amazon? Oh, man. So uh, I went up there to do indie game scouting and, like, basically new, new game finding for Fire TV. Okay, right? so they were looking for exclusive games for Fire TV or just <sighs> anything, really looking, just stuff that they, they could looking... sign to the service? Yeah, basically, so, you know, Fire TV was a Android-based box for the television, right? Yep. And so the idea was, like, this is the era of, uh, this is the era of uh, just after Ouya, right? And so yep. Ouya had made a pretty big splash. <laughs> it did, and then it splatted. <laughs> well, then it splatted, right? Uh, but what it demonstrated was that, especially during that era, which is the early era of indies, Unity games would run, like, awesome on an Android-based box. Yep. And so uh, we had OpenGL on there. So we were able actually to go out and talk to developers and say, hey, we can bring you over to the platform. We actually, I can give you white label support. In other words, I can give, I can put some engineers against helping you get your title ported over to our to our box. No, you, like we don't have a huge install base today, but really it's not going to cost you anything to get over here. I'll throw marketing against it and the marketing will be on Amazon. So even if you don't sell on Fire TV, you're going to get some more recognition for your title. Isn't this a decent deal? Um, and so uh, we took that a little ways. So I was working with uh, Lenny Simon, Tyler Cooper, John Sacrani, like a really cool team. Uh, but very quickly, we came up against the wall, which was that uh, we were working for a content team, but the hardware was made by a hardware team. And those weren't the same teams. Yeah. And we're in the same buildings at Amazon. No. And so uh, we didn't really have any support. <laughs> So and you didn't know what well, they wanted and you didn't have the resources to secure. And we could have all the great ideas in the world that we wanted. But at the end of the day, the only thing that mattered was selling hardware. And the reason they were selling hardware was to get people to play Amazon video on their televisions. Yeah. So the reason they were doing games was because somewhere along the lines, Jeff Bezos had said, I think games are really important. And so people were like, games are really important. We need to do games. And so they're like, cool, we're going to keep doing some games. But they weren't, their hearts weren't in it. I mean, yeah. this is not, and, and, and the problem was, uh, like I was be, saying in about- In some cases, that can be a good position to be in, where you're working for a company like Amazon, presumably pulling in a pretty nice salary, and you're just kind of flying under the radar and no one's really holding you accountable and no one's expecting uh, anything. 
Yeah, except for the fact that you want to do something, man. You yeah, don't want to be it's like not a, a very bump on a log. way to go yeah. about your day to day. And yeah. plus, and plus, like we had, we, I mean, we believed in what we were doing. Like there was a really cool moment there because, I mean, to keep in mind, PC games, PC games, and PC gaming is always expensive, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's you, you can't justify buying a, you can't justify buying two thousand dollars worth of computer to play a fourteen ninety nine indie game. Yeah. I mean, at least it's hard to do that. Yeah. Uh, but you can sure as hell justify buying a ninety-nine dollar box to play nine ninety-nine or fourteen ninety-nine indie games. You're beating we Pactor's thought... drum right now, Garnet. This is Pactor. This is one of Pactor's favorite lines that he uses all the time. He He's thinks right. he thinks that like Amazon, like Fire TV or Kin- was gonna is gonna take over gaming. Like he believes that eventually they're gonna have a GPU well, we... and a CPU built into those things. And eventually they're going to be like how a lot of people play games instead of buying consoles and things like that. Only, only if the, that's not going to be, you know, it wouldn't happen at Amazon. I don't think it would happen at Amazon because the reality is that, so like, like here, so here's one of the fundamental problem. Some of the problems we ran into, number one, fire TV is this box. that's meant for game for streaming video, right? Mm -hmm. Prime video is the main attraction there. Right? So when you turn on your fire TV, you're going to see, uh, a bunch of movies you're going to see a bunch of television shows you're going to see amazon originals you hear mm-hmm. what you're not seeing games yeah you're not seeing games yeah. and you're not going to convince anyone in amazon senior management to take anything out of that top scroll and put games into it you're just not and matter of fact it's so buried that you would in fact have to go down and start the amazon app store and then open the app store and then you could look at games so they're not even in a they're not even in a horizontal channel uh, we went through a design exercise with a really awesome uh, designer there to like build an alternate UI because one of the pitches that we gave was, hey, what if when you bought your Fire TV, you could choose which front end you wanted? You could be like, hey, I'm primarily a movie watcher. I want to see movies. I'm right. primarily a gamer. I want to see games. And while all of that makes sense to us, no, because they don't want to take the emphasis away from the fact that it's a video box, right? Well, Amazon Prime is their bread and butter. And it is. most people get Prime for the free shipping, but also for Amazon Prime Video. So you're, I can and, understand Amazon's stance on that. Yeah, yeah, and everything that they do is about signing people up for Prime, yep. right? Because it puts, them, it puts you in the ecosystem, right? Well, so, it means you're giving them $140, $150 a year. <laughs> right, but I mean, you can do the math in your head pretty easily that – you can get more than $140 worth of value out of Amazon Prime if you didn't buy anything else from them. But the reality is if you're an Amazon That's tough, Prime... That's uh, I mean, many... Unless you think... Because look, I don't think that Amazon's video is equal to Netflix. So would I subscribe to Amazon Prime Video if it wasn't wrapped into... Man in the High Castle? Probably not. Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. No, no. I mean, I know there are exceptions, obviously, but I probably wouldn't. What I'm saying is, like, it costs a lot of money to make those productions. I know, I know, I know. So if you look at the cost it puts to 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 get those productions, plus the cost it takes for them to have the like the number of movies and shows they have that are free, yeah, plus the shipping benefits, like they're not making money off of Prime from that. They're making money off of Prime because they know that once you're a Prime member, you're going to buy way more stuff from them than if you're not. Yeah. Because of the know. free shipping, yeah. Right. See, so, because once you're once you're an once you're an Amazon, I would be willing to bet you. I mean, I, I I was not privy to any of this stuff, but I would be willing to bet you that once you become a Prime member, you all but stop shopping anywhere else. Pretty much, and I would also argue that the cut rate is probably really low. Like, I don't think once you become, if oh you, yeah, as once long you start, you're in. It, like once you're a Prime member, I don't think a lot of people drop Prime because. Again, it makes your life. It changes your life. You don't have to shop anymore. You can just buy yeah. everything, and it shows up on your doorstep a day later. Like, it's that you're absolutely right. You end up buying everything from Amazon from that point forward. I do. Yeah. I mean, awfully. And if it's not at Amazon, I'm surprised, and I will go somewhere else like Costco or whatever. Uh, but if it's if it's for sale on Amazon, I'll buy it from Amazon once you're in, so, in the Prime ecosystem. Yeah. So the thing is, a game console is not really going to drive that ecosystem for them. Yeah. And that's the problem with it. And so okay. that's why that's why it was always tough. So when they went to make a Fire TV second version, they wanted to upgrade the hardware capabilities. Upgrading the hardware capabilities was great, except they decided to make their own chip. And when they did, they went to a different uh, they went to power VR rendering instead of OpenGL, which meant that all the games that we had had to be re had to have all their uh, compression libraries redone. Oh, geez. 
so basically that was the end of fire tv gaming at least for the initiatives we had done uh yep. so most of us moved on that was when i went over to the engine that's when you uh, started working on lumberyard correct yeah yeah, Which so Dan was Winters. Amazon's engine that it was hoping would end up competing with Unreal and Unity and all these other engines. Uh, yes, sort of. I mean, I mean well, then what was the point of it, if not that? Uh, the point of it was, again, think about, think about things in terms of Amazon. Amazon wanted to have an engine because if you build on Amazon's engine, you're more than likely going to use Amazon AWS. Web Services. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's again, and so it's a so that's where the play was, uh, and building a game engine is really hard. Like that again, this is yes. so like that's why questions... Unreal has been around for twenty some years. Yeah, like, it takes that long to build all the libraries and all the tools and right. Yeah. So the reason that they bought and and there was some misunderstanding. They didn't buy a CryEngine. They bought a fork of it, and they mm. bought the fork just for the rendering engine. No. So, so in other words, like there's all these systems, there's like network system, there's AI, there's scripting, the animation, but rendering is a big one, right? And CryEngine always looked great. They're like, cool, we'll just buy the Crytek rendering engine and we can focus on other parts, right? Mm -hmm. The problem was by the time they start, when they started bolting other parts on and messing around with the engine and tearing the guts out of it, they felt very quickly, like the, like, like the, the usability of Lumberyard, like if it started here, like just started going like this because as we were adding functionality to it and and improving it, we were actually making the thing not work. Yeah, I've because also heard that CryEngine is a piece of junk. I mean, you would know better than me, but no, it's not a piece of junk. It's not. It's definitely. It's just super hard. It's it is it is a programmer's programming language or engine that was written by a company to do their games but also sold because it makes for beautiful games. I mean, look, everyone built to the, everyone's gone to the raptures on that engine. And it's one of the reasons the thing looks so damn beautiful. It was a very powerful rendering engine, but it's tool set, which is what the day-to-day a -day, uh, engineer works with was just not there. You know, it's just, it was a really tough engine to work with. And that's, well, that's why people, so I guess, I mean, people will, will, will say it's a piece of junk, but it's not that the engine is a piece of junk. It's that working with it. I mean, you need to have a 250 person team who has, you know, a sizable number of those people devoted to, to building your tool set. You know, you and, need to be Infinity Ward or something. Right. And then Amazon moves into game development. It <laughs> begins yeah. to try to create its own original games, which has, at this point, been pretty much an unmitigated disaster. Why yes. do you think that is, Garnet? Why, why, can, why is it that huge companies like Amazon or Google cannot figure out how to wrangle internal development? Because the two big companies that are doing it, and this is why, like I, I worked in and around those teams, but definitely decided not to go. You know, when I left Amazon, it was to leave Amazon and not to go down any of those paths. Is because I'd seen enough, and I can tell you, I, I would bet you it's the same problem at Google. These are big tech companies, and big tech companies have become successful by moving very fast, and by moving in tech spaces and tech space, and, and while. And this is the misconception. And if you go back to like video games early days, like when we were first looking, when we were first writing about games, when you were first writing about games at GameSpot or wherever, uh, it's like everyone wanted you to write reviews like tech reviews, right? Yeah. How good are the graphics? How well is the performance done? Because it was thought of as a as an app, right? Yep. And Google and Amazon think of games as software apps, and they don't they don't get the creative side of it. And so they don't understand why they can look at a project to build a you know, complex data stream analysis system that puts stuff into like a, a, a AI net that understands how to analyze data points in 18 months, but they can't build a game that fast. Yeah. And it's because one of them is an engineering and logic problem. And one of them is an engineering Creative and logic problem and an engineering and logic problem. It's both. Yeah. And that's the thing. And so then when they have their senior leadership who have been on top of uh, programming projects and have seen how to run them rapidly, they try to take the same approaches. And so they do a lot of go, no goes. They do a lot of deep dives and you wind up with people who are have never been in the game industry or don't have a deep appreciation of the game industry looking at gray boxes. Have you ever looked at gray box games? And gray yeah. boxing is like where you, so gray boxing is basically where you've got uh, primitives inside, <laughs> how to make this not sound too techy. Uh, so <laughs> primitives that, inside the gray box. 
So imagine you you've got a bunch of act, act so actors are like the objects and so you've got a bunch of things you got a, you got a game but the game doesn't have any of the visuals yet it's just things it's just my it might be off the shelf assets it might be a basic environment so but it's it like doesn't look Miyamoto says when he works on a Mario game Mario starts out as just a box that moves around yeah. yeah yeah so you've just got that stuff and if you can't look at that and understand what it's going to look like in 18 months then it's really you're like wow we're paying 150 200 people to work on this what the hell is this mm -hmm. so then what happened after the first round of people getting put down and like moved on or shuffled around or kim kim leaving and all that kind of stuff is that then then the teams get scared kim who swift okay remember she had come over and was going to build a narrative game and and she stayed around for a while she went over to twitch for a while actually to try and help with content but that's a whole other subject uh anyway um the, what happens is the teams get scared and so then they start building really arted out vertical slices but this is a this is a really bad trap now because let's say you're building this big uh like so let's say we're building breakaway because they were building breakaway mm -hmm. and you have this entire concept for for an esports game but you need a two minute clip to show an executive to get them to understand how the game works and so the gray bar isn't going to work. <laughs> right. So so now you go almost to final visuals, but you really haven't worked out a bunch of the design parts yet. And you haven't figured out exactly all the things that you're going to do, but you have to throw stuff in there. You're like, I got to throw some cool stuff in there. I got to get their attention. I got to make it look cool. And either one, either you land it and it looks cool. And then you have to figure out how to make it work like that. So you're or building it doesn't games land. in reverse, essentially, at these big tech totally. companies is what you're saying. Yes, and that's the and, worst way and, to build a game. And never allowing the people who are the experts who are, it's like you went out and hired these really great designer people like Ian Vogel, uh, who had worked on Bioshock, and you let them do their thing just long enough to get almost there. And then you're like, I don't know, it's not working. Let's go a different direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're used to these products being built very quickly. And they're, they're, they're used to a much faster iteration cycle, which mm -hmm. is the way that is the way the tech tech uh, clients work right i mean yep. like you like look at how fast any of the things that you use in your or like dropbox or twitter or whatever like this like you can just crank out updates to it right yeah and you can add functionality you can take functionality away you can improve you can you just are changing this thing all the time but that's not the way a game works yeah especially not a big game it's also has lots i would argue systems. you know we talk all the time on game face about games that do or do not have a soul <laughs> and yeah. i and it's like this ambiguous thing that's kind of hard to explain, but I would argue that a game, the chance of a game having a soul, developing it in the manner that you're, that you're suggesting Amazon try to approach it, it's never going to happen. It's tough. It's tough. You get a lot. And, and, and that's a, that's a, that would be another problem. And I would imagine that Google's had that as well as that they are super data reliant. And so that means they're going to be constantly looking at how long are people playing? How long are they doing this? How long is this activity taking? And, you know, when you work in a creative uh, game space around, especially on game design, the way a player picks up and plays the game the first day is not the way the player picks up and plays the game five days later. Mm -hmm. But you do need to understand, you, like, I think there is a great space for telemetry in games if you are able to ask the right, it's like anything else with data. You can make it say anything you want it to. You right? can manipulate data to make it you, say whatever you want. You can yeah. manipulate it to make it say anything. Or if you don't know what you're looking at, you can make all kinds of wrong assumptions. And I think that's what happens a lot is they just look at it, they get impatient, and they make bad decisions. And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of people working on Lost World. I really hope for them, I hope for their sakes that it comes together. It was... Do you think Lost it will? World, uh, you know, I, I, Shane, I was playing betas of Lost World before I left Amazon three years ago. Wow. So, so I should take that as a no. <laughs> I just don't know. I, 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 I think that it's, I think that for the sort of game it is, and as we've seen in early access games, I mean, I've got a game in our stable that we're working on that we're about to put in, we're going to put into early access and we're going to put it into early access because we want to know more. Yeah. Like it's, it, we want players to play it. It's not perfect. Like it's been, but players understand that you can't, polish things into a perfected like diamond especially not with a lot of subsystems and just say like here it is it's perfect yeah dota was not dota on day one yeah that's so. for sure i mean you can look at a lot of games like guys again i was just talking to greg kasav and he was talking about hades and i asked him i'm like you know so 
They did early access. Yeah. The game was in early access for a really long time. And I was like, did that, were you concerned that when the actual release date, quote unquote, comes for the game, that the excitement, the punch that you usually get from release day is gone. And he's like, no, he's like, because you've worked with these players for so long, you know what they're expecting and you know that they've helped you get it to this place where we're ready to premiere the game to people who, because look, let's be honest, the vast majority of people who buy games have not, they don't have anything to do with early access. They may not even know it exists. All they know is this hot game just released and everyone's talking about it. And those are the people where that early access period really pays the dividends for. So it's a different time. Than it was and, 10, 15 and you know, years that's ago. exactly like like Valheim is so successful. Like yes. look at Valheim. Valheim Another is like example. the visuals of it are not the thing. It's the game. And it's the fact that players are in there and playing it and the developers seeing how they're playing it and understanding like they they now know exactly what to do for the next 18 months of development. And, and Greg also awesome. brought up too that you know a lot of times you do your early access on PC and yeah. then you use the release day to release it on the consoles. And so True it hits this whole new audience that didn't even know it existed and it's all polished and it's great. It's in a could, much better state. Yeah. And then the sales just explode. Like they released um, Hades on switch the day it went mm-hmm. 1.0 and boom. It's important. <laughs> it, it's especially important for smaller teams. I mean, you know, like the largest games that we work with as indie developers. And I mean, look, raw fury, raw fury. Yeah, let's is rewind not, here. So you left Amazon and yeah, yeah. to raw fury. You now live in Sweden. Well, I took a year off. <laughs> You did, you well, took I didn't a take a year off. off. My my plan was to take my plan was I was kind of burned up. I was going to take a year off, um, and after after like a summer of adventure and stuff, I was already getting anxious and getting the itch, and people were talking. And uh, so, longtime friend Jonas Antonsen, who I'd met uh, years prior uh, when he was at Paradox, and then had started Raw Fury, uh, and he had always told me about the dream and the, like this that this company is like it's the indie game development u- u- utopia. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Uh, we are, we're, we are, we genuinely like, I, I don't want to market us too much, uh, cause that's not what this is about, but like, go we ahead. Do, I mean, you've taken we, the time do, to come on the show. We, we do what we say. It like, we, we, the develop that when we enter into an agreement with a developer, the developer runs the show. I, we're the, like the only publisher that I know of that we, we have no controlling, uh, we, we don't have anything in our contracts that allows us to tell developers what to do. So we're not able to, like, when we talk to them, like I do, so I'm, my job is like marketing product sort of the brand person, right? So, you know, I'm playing the games a lot and giving a lot of feedback to developers and, you know, the sort of stuff that like hit detection and so forth does. Like mm-hmm. I can tell my developers, hey, I think that this would be a really great way to change, you know, the focus of the way this character interacts with the world. Or I think this would be a really great uh, addition to the skill system. And we'll talk those things through. And it's actually awesome because the fact that they know that they don't have to listen to a word that I say means means that we actually have design conversations. Like we actually talk about design, like we do game design. Uh, But at the same time, it also means that a lot of times they're just like, nope, not going to do that. Mm -mm." And it's like, okay, cool. (laughs) (laughs) But it's tough. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's tough for me too, because as as the person, like I wouldn't bring it. I mean, you've been evaluating games for like 20 years. (laughs) And I wouldn't bring it to the developer if I didn't think it was a really good idea. Yeah. At the same time, like it's it is their baby and you we i i love that we love honor and respect that so uh-huh. that's really cool and uh, and uh that i mean that's really it it's a, it's amazing place to work it's an amazing place to work we a lot of our games we wind up uh letting we let the developers push the release dates back we help them continuing their funding we now try you guys to make are sure... you guys are signing games but also developing games internally is that right no actually one of the things we don't do is we we're we're staunchly not doing any of our own development Okay. Yeah, we don't. So but you're just so strictly one, a publisher. Yeah, because it creates a weird, it creates like we don't ever like again back to that thing. We don't. We would never want a developer to work with us and think, but are you guys actually giving your own team a better deal? Like, do oh, they get the A yet. team? It's a conflict of yeah. interest. Yeah. Yeah, I, we don't want them to think. So, uh, the, well, the one game that did come to us was the Kingdoms games. So the Kingdoms games got really successful, and the developer really wanted to go on. And he's like, "We're like, we you can do way more games with this. Like this IP is successful now." And he's like, "But I don't want to. I want to go do something different." Mm. So uh, Raw Fury has the IP, and the team. Do you guys own go, the IP for the games that you sign generally? No, never. As a matter okay. of fact, that's another thing. We ne- so our deals. We never. We never. 
own the IP. The developer always keeps the IP, and we never do write. Uh, we never do like psych SQL writes. The only thing we have is we often will get like a first refusal ask, but mm -hmm. it's just an ask. Uh, so anyway, long story short is that the Kingdom's team uh, became its own studio, and it's separate, and they founded their own studio because again, we didn't. We have a Raw Fury studio, but Raw Fury studio for us is a porting team. So basically, oh, okay. it's a bunch of so basically, we we asked we, the way development works for us is a uh, game. You're, you, let's say Shane's making a game. We ask you to make a game in PC format, and so you build in Unity or Unreal or Game Maker, whatever you want to build in, uh, and you deliver a build for PC. And then we talk about what other platforms we want it to go on, and we use porting partners, our porting team, to put it out on those part on those platforms. How cutthroat is it signing indie games? Like, are you constantly competing with 504 games and all these other indie publishers to get that game? I like, mean, awesome question. Is there, are there bidding wars? Like, how does that all play out? I I think that it probably is that way. I don't, you know, I don't know. It, it probably, there probably are bidding wars for some of the other outlets. Like there are, are there events that you go to where a bunch of indie developers show up and demo their <laughs> games and like a bunch of publishers come and like you guys all check them Shane, out. We don't have to do time? that anymore. We got, we got over 2000 pitches into our pitch portal last year. Damn. Like we're not, we're not, we're not short for pitches. Yeah. So I think that part of the reason that we don't have to like, like we work. I mean, so, I guess that would be E3, wouldn't it? Where all the developers No, I mean, there's some of that. There's some of that. It's more, it's more GDC, Gamescom. but also yeah, Bit Summit, different indie games, summits like that. Mm -hmm. Um, we're also we're a, we're a company is run on a process or a, a system called holacracy so there's no structure in the company everybody is on equal standing from ceo through the entire company mm -hmm. and when we go to sign games like we have a couple of folks who uh, are primary scouts but everybody in the company looks at games and we talk about them and we only sign games that we really love like we don't sign them for we don't sign them for commercial potential we sign them because we're like damn th we we should make this game this is really cool or it has a cool story. I mean, assuming so, that nine times out of 10, that's also going to result in commercial success. I mean, not necessarily. Really? I mean, like, so you would intentionally take on a game that you know is going to have limited commercial appeal. We would intentionally take on a game that we were in love with, even if it didn't appear to have tremendous commercial appeal. It's like a Katamari Damacy type deal where you look sure, at it and you're doubt, like, man, yeah. I can't imagine a lot of people really wanting to buy this, but it's really cool. And maybe it will catch fire, like one of those kind of deals. Well, I mean, the next thing we would do actually is we would say, "Hey, we're a bunch of industry professionals, and, and we've been around a block a few times. It's it is it is our job to help that developer be successful. Because if we think it's really cool, then why the hell is it not going to be commercially successful? Because if, yeah. if we if, like if we know what the hell we're talking about and we really like this game, then it ought to be successful. So then it's sort of on my shoulders to be, wow, figure out how to talk about this game, figure out how to show it to people, figure out how to get, help the developer build it into something that will work." Uh, because it ought to be, and that's what we do. And speaking of pushing those games, you have a podcast, a new podcast. I uh, do. Well, it's a good is segue. Your, is this your first podcast since uh, Weekend Confirmed? Uh, it is. Yeah, it is called, indeed. I did. The title is Games, Potatoes, and Spatulas, correct? <laughs> yes, that is. <laughs> explain, yeah, that is exactly. Please explain Game, that. Games, Potatoes, title. and Spatulas. Uh, so... Again, Rafi, dude, I'm telling you, this place is awesome. It's a this this place is a madhouse of a bunch of game people who like indie games and get to make games. Uh, so uh, we did a thing a while ago, like potatoes and spatulas are just kind of two random things that we think are cool. Uh, okay. And we make we, <laughs> at some point in time, we're probably going to do some cooking on. So we do it as a stream that we record and put on the podcast, and we have like a little kitchen we're setting up so that we can make like potato. No treats. way. <laughs> Where can people find the podcast, Garnet? Uh, it's all over the place now. So it's uh, we're hosting on Libsyn. So it's uh, the RSS feed is what is it? Uh, GPS GPS Raw Fury dot Libsyn dot com. Okay. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on uh, it's on the Spotify thing. On the I think Spotify it's on Google. Thing. It should be on it's Google not like now. Apple Podcasts and everything. It's on, yeah, it's, it's it's on the Apple. It's on the Apple syndication service. I've been pushing. Uh, I got like a three or four more episodes that are finished. But yeah, within the next week or so, we'll be up to normal. We record every Thursday night at uh, twenty one hundred Central European time, and we do that on Twitch. Uh, so that's like one o'clock in the afternoon there in the West and, Coast and four p.m. East Coast time. Yeah. What's yeah. your Twitch channel for that? What's the URL? It's uh, Twitch.rawfury. Okay. 
twitch.tv slash raw twitch, fury twitch tv twitch.tv slash raw, raw fury. fury you'll put it all in your show notes right absolutely for sure um awesome. and and is it all is it games or is it games and cooking or is it's, it not is it no games at all so it's me and Jonas who have been friends for a long time uh we so i you know look i pulled some of the benchmarks that i have done before so we do a what you've been playing st- segment okay. i love talking about news and topics so we do that uh i'm we, I, look i'm Really Are you allowed to in- talk about other publishers' games and stuff? Uh, what do you mean allowed? We don't. We don't actually talk about any of our own games. We, we're nine episodes in. We have not talked about a single one of our games. That's. It's really cool that Raw Fury allows you to do that because yeah, and well, you know yeah, the as well as I do that if you watch a Nintendo podcast, they're not talking about PlayStation games or Xbox games, or if you're watching a Sony podcast, they're not talking about Nintendo and Microsoft stuff. We really believe. I mean, this like I. We sound like crazy people, but we really believe in indie games. And if we can, if this pod, if look at my ability to like build a podcast can work out again and we can build a podcast that's great for indie games, that's amazing. As a matter of fact, I just gave an invitation on this week's show and I'll say it here again. If you have any developers, if you're an indie game developer and you would like us to talk about your game on our show, uh, send me an email, potato, potato at rawfury.com. <laughs> that's the email. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, and I mean, look, we're, 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 and again, I have to be, I have to, my uh, legal said, I have to say that we are not making an offer to uh, publish or promote your game or any of that kind of stuff, but I just want to we'll talk be glad. About We'll be, yeah, and give you feedback. We can help you with develop your pitch, uh, all that kind of stuff. We're here. That's we we love indie games. We can only publish so many of them a year. Like I said, we got two thousand pitches last year. There's a lot of Insane. games out there that deserve they deserve love, and so we're gonna get them love. That's great. Um, and then we ask every guest on Uh-oh. three night weekend, what are they playing? What are they ah. watching? And what are they drinking this weekend? Uh, so uh, I'm playing Loop Hero right now. This two weeks in a row. That's yeah. A, well, that's the game playing. that uh, Greg said he was playing last week. Oh, really? Yeah. That's awesome. It's it's, it's really cool because it, the mechanics element of it really clicks and just it's just dre- dre- it's totally drenched in like this nostalgia. Uh, I also started playing BattleTech, uh, which you know every so often you got to tromp around in a giant robot and blow stuff up. Yeah. Uh, what am I watching? Uh, Kate and I are going to watch. Uh, uh, I think we're going to watch Frida tonight. We decided okay. we were going to do like a, a, a Mexican movie night. So we're doing, I think we watch Frida and I'm drinking water. Drinking water, water, huh? Yeah, I told you. I told how you, have, like, how have your drinking habits been through the pandemic? Because Garnet, I have not oh. had a drop of alcohol since February 28th of last year. It's now been an, over a year since That's I've had awesome. a drop of alcohol. And, what about you? Have you been drinking through and, the Oh yeah, we, I mean yeah, yes, yeah. It's yeah. up and down. <laughs> I would say that I would say that uh, up and down, and then moving here, uh, Swedish drinking is really interesting because the, all the alcohol is sold through a state store. It's like Pennsylvania. And the state, and the state yeah, the state store is only open <laughs> till like eight p.m. on weekdays. Also like three Pennsylvania. O'clock, three o'clock on Saturday and closed on Sundays. So yeah. It's it, it, coupled with pandemic drinking. Like what the problem is, is we Sweden a really like, conservative country yes and no it's just quiet it's just quiet but on the weekend people do drink a lot and have fun and all that kind of stuff but what we found was we is like you would go and because you had to go to the store and stock up you inevitably had more booze in your house than you really wanted <laughs> yeah. and then you wound up drinking it um so we're just taking a break and okay. i don't know where i you know i don't i don't know where that comes back I, I would say i have my i am a cheating a little bit because thursday night when Jonas and i do our podcast we drink beers because it's okay. part of the whole part of the whole thing is like hanging out guys hanging out drinking beers and talking games and and politics and well you don't actually we don't do politics we do philosophy philosophy movies swedish things games and game design and we're also doing a whole segment on so you think you want to make a game we're going to talk we're going to go all the way through what it takes to develop a indie game if there's one Swedish beer you would recommend for people to check out, what would it be? Uh, wow, one Swedish beer to recommend. So there's a brewer here in Stockholm that's called Northern Exposure. Okay. I don't know if you'll be able to get them. They're craft brewer. Uh, it's actually two New Zealand guys who moved here. Uh, and of course, having lived in Seattle, uh, they make IPAs. <laughs> uh, okay. But they're um, good. And Garnet, where can people find you personally on social media? Uh, at Garnet Lee, uh, Twitter, that's my, that's one place I still use the most. If you use the Facebooks, I go over there occasionally. I, I still have my Garnet on Games page, uh, which I'm using now as sort of an ad hoc page for uh, our podcast as well. But if you want to get at me wherever, uh, Garnet on Games or at, at Garnet Lee on Twitter. All right, Garnet, always good to catch up with you, man. Much love, my brother, and best of luck with Raw Fury and your new home in Sweden.
All right, now that you know what Garnet recommends, what are you going to do with your weekend? Games! The dregs of March just keep marching on. It's slim pickings this weekend if you're looking for new games to play. Plants vs. Zombies Battle for Neighborville launches for Switch today, along with a visual novel from Japan called Root Film. It's the sequel to cult hit favorite Root Letter, and it launches for PS4 and Switch today. TV and film! We're going to go back a day or two here to recommend something that you probably already know about, but it is the Justice League Snyder Cut debuting on HBO Max. It is an extended, reworked, reshot version of Justice League. Obviously, your mileage with this is going to vary depending on how much you like the original. We were not big fans. Theaters are starting to reopen and people are starting to go back. And if you're looking for something to go check out, The Courier debuts this weekend. It's a true life spy thriller set during the Cuban Missile Crisis starring Benedict Cumberbatch. On streaming services, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier debuts today on Disney+. Plus. The pair that came together in the final moments of Avengers Endgame teams up for a global adventure that tests their abilities and their patience. Also debuting this weekend is Calls Season 1 on Apple TV. This is a strange kind of experiment that Apple TV is doing. It's a show that kind of functions on phone calls and visualizations. It's a new concept and something worth checking out. And then finally on Sunday, Q, Into the Storm, debuts on HBO Max. It is a documentary on the QAnon phenomenon, psychosis, cult, whatever you want to call it. It's a six-part series that claims to finally unveil the true identity of Q. Music! Three big album releases this week, and all of them are coming out today. The first one, I know most of you guys may not care all that much about it, but it is definitely going to be the biggest release of the week. Justin Bieber has a new album today called Justice. It is exactly what you'd expect. A lot of poppy, sappy, R&B tinged tracks with lots of guest performers joining him on each one of them. And then Lana Del Rey has a new album out today called Chemtrails Over the Country Club. Just what you'd expect from her as well, a collection of seductive ballads. And then finally, Sting has a brand new album out today that was delayed from last November. It's called Duets, and true to the name, it is a collection of duets he does with other artists. Uh, Eric Clapton, Mary J. Blige, and a bunch of others. Sports! If you're planning on chilling on the couch with a bunch of sports this weekend, I hope you like basketball, because it is all about NCAA March Madness. The tournament has kicked off already. Already some teams have been eliminated. Hopefully your brackets haven't been busted yet. But if you're looking to check all that out, it's mostly on three networks, TBS, TNT, and CBS. Also kicking off today, the 2021 CONCACAF Olympic Qualifying Championship on Fox Sports 1, and it also rocks all weekend long. Moving on to Saturday, I know a lot of our folks in Europe love rugby. And on Saturday, the Six Nations Championship, France versus Wales, kicks off at 4 p.m. Eastern on NBCSN. If you're looking for some pucks, the Wild take on the Avalanche on NHL Network at 3 p.m. Eastern. And then right after that, it's the Flyers versus the Islanders at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then later that night, if you're looking for some MMA, ESPN UFC Fight Night Brunson versus Holland kicks off at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Then to wrap up the weekend on Sunday at 325 Eastern, Tottenham versus Aston Villa is on NBCSN. And then if you're looking for some women's basketball, the women's tourney kicks off on ESPN and ABC. If you're looking for some golf, the final round of the Honda Classic starts at 3 p.m. on NBC. And then if you're looking for some NASCAR, the Folds of Honor Quick Trip 500 is going down at 3 p.m. on Fox. Esports. There's a couple big tournaments going on this weekend. The 2021 League Championship Series Mid-Season Showdown, that's a mouthful, kicks off this weekend and runs until April 10th. And then if you're into Rainbow Six Siege, South America's biggest tournament of the year is going on the 2021 Campeonato Suda Americano with a purse of 300K is also going down all weekend long. Thanks for checking out Three Night Weekend from Sifted Games at Sifted.net. Once again, a big thanks for Garnet Lee coming on the show. If you want to get it when it's hot and fresh, head to patreon.com slash sifted and give us a pledge. Uh, If you give us $4 a month or more, you'll get this every Friday morning. If you want to know when the show is posted for free, follow us on Twitter at Sifted Games. And if you want to reach out to me and suggest future guests, you can find me at Dinfire. I'm Shane Satterfield reminding you that every weekend is a three-night weekend. (laughs) 